we were talking about properties of the cross product. Okay, so then this is properties of the cross product continued. So then, there's a couple things I'd like to mention. So, so far in this class, how many products do we have for vectors? How many different ones? Two different products, right? There's the scalar product. The scalar product works for vectors of which dimension? Any dimension. Any dimension. The scalar product works in any, any dimension. Okay, how about the cross product? Where does it work? Three. Three only. So it works in the third dimension only. So uh, interestingly, the result of the scalar product is a scalar, whereas the result of the cross product is a vector. Okay, good. So any questions considering those things? Okay, so the last thing, <coughs> the last thing that I said was property number, s I don't know where I was. What number was I on? Five. Okay, so the last thing I had said was property number five of the cross product is that u cross u, like this. Well, so in the case of the scalar product, u scalar product u was the length of u squared. That's what it was for the scalar product. So u cross u is what? Zero. The zero vector. Okay, that's interesting. We're going to see why that's the case in just a minute. But for now, understand that's kind of weird, right? This is kind of weird. This is for all u, right? Not, this, not just the zero vector. So if you take some really long vector, as long as you like, and you cross it with itself, zero every time. Okay, so that's kind of strange. Okay, property six is this, and we'll go over the, the geometric interpretation of this in a minute, but here it is. So u scalar product v cross w. So we're talking about the interaction between the two products that we know, the interaction between the scalar product and the cross product. So then let's look at these two terms real quick. So then, according to the parentheses, what do you have to do first? The cross product first. So you do this cross product thing. V cross W will be a vector. And then scalar product with U, the result will be a what? A scalar. So altogether, this, this thing on the left-hand side of this equation I'm writing represents a scalar. It is equal to u cross v scalar product w. Okay, so then the right-hand side, is it a vector or is it a scalar? It's a scalar also. Okay, so then now, what this is telling you, the, one, the, the primary thing you need to take away, besides the fact that this is a fact, is that notice on the left side, u, v, and w, the order is u, v, w, and on the right side it is u, v, w. Good. So any question about this? So incidentally, mm, I always write the parentheses, but you will find some places on the internet that don't write parentheses. Right? They'll write something like this, A cross B dot C. They don't write the parentheses because people are lazy and they don't like to, you know, they like to minimize the number of, you know, strokes that they have to write on the paper. So there's only one thing that this could possibly mean. What, what is the only thing that this could possibly mean? Right, this could only mean A cross B, and then you take the scalar product of that with C. Why could it not, why could it not be this? Why could it not be uh, A cross B dot C, like so? Ah, because B, B dot C is a scalar, and there is no such thing as the cross of a vector and a scalar. Okay, so then this brings up a joke. <laughs> okay, the joke is, is what happens, what happens if you take a mountain climber, right, this is a biology joke. What happens if you take a mountain climber and you cross it with a mosquito? Nothing, right? You can't do that. You can't cross a scalar and a vector. <laughs> it's so funny because another name for a mountain climber is a scalar, and biologically another name for a mosquito is a vector. <laughs> a 
Lovely. Okay, so then let's forget that that was ever said. Okay, so any questions about this? Don't worry, I'm full of such uh, humor. Okay, so then now we need to talk about the geometry, the geometry of the cross product. <coughs> Okay, so then now, this, is, this one right here is probably the principal thing, one of the principal things that is going to be in, of interest to you. So, in particular, U cross V. So first off, I can say this, this is not a new thing, is a vector. Right? So first off, U cross V is a vector. But, more specifically, U cross V is a vector which is orthogonal, have I written down this before, this one, which is orthogonal to both u and v. It's orthogonal to both of them. Okay, so then if I give you two vectors u and v and you compute their cross product, then as a, you will find as a result another vector, and that vector will be orthogonal to both of them. Okay, so then now, Mm, for example, if I was to take if I was to take mm, these two vectors, this could be u and this other one v. Okay, now <coughs> I'm I'm ignoring one small point just for a minute. So then these these u and v are in in the page in the plane of the page or in the plane of the board. Okay, so then u cross v, if I compute their cross product, it has to be orthogonal to u, to u and it has to also be orthogonal to v. So in which, in which direction is u cross v pointing? And I'm omitting something that if, I'm omitting one small point that I'm going to talk about later. So where is it? It's either, it's either coming directly out of the page, directly out of the board, or directly into the board. Okay? Does everybody see that? So in order to find a vector which is orthogonal to both of these, it must be coming directly out of the page or directly into the page. Okay, so any question about that? Okay, so then that brings up the second point. <coughs> the second point. That the cross product is right-handed. Okay, so this is like sort of a physicist term. Okay, so there are two uh, possibilities here. I can make a copy of this thing here. This is this is one of the greatest things about using this is I can just see the <laughs> isn't that great. Okay, so then now I'll make another copy. <coughs> okay, so then now there are two way. Oops, there are two ways to compute the cross product of u and v. What is one of the ways? Right, there's u cross v. And what is the other way? v cross u. Okay, now I have a question for you. Are these the same? No, no. At the end of last lecture, I, I told you how these are related. How is u cross v related to v cross u? They are, they are opposite signs of each other. So then that's, if they were the same sign, if they were exactly equal and the same sign, then that would be called commutativity. They would be, this would, the cross product would be a commutative operation. But the, the sign is different, the sign is opposite, so then the cross product is not commutative, it is anti-commutative. Okay, so then now, in view of the previous comment, in view of the previous comment that the cross product is orthogonal to both u and v, then you know that since these vectors fall in the page, one of them is going in the page and one of them is going out of the page. And what I'm going to tell you right now is which one is which. Y either u cross v is coming out of the page or v cross u is coming out of the page. One of them is coming out of the page. Okay. So then, the way this goes is like follows. u cross v <coughs> okay, is... I'll choose pink, I guess. u cross v 
is computing the cross product in this direction, right? So it's u to v, u to v, whereas this one is v to u, right? So does everybody see that, you know, if you were reading a clock, <laughs> then this one would be clockwise, and this one would be counterclockwise according to the drawing. So does everybody see that the direction of the, cr of the crossing is different? So now, hold up your right hand, okay? And then now, align... Align your hand like so with U. Okay, look at U. And now turn your hand toward V. All right, so then for me, it will look like, for you, it will look like this. U to V. U to V. Now hold your thumb out. U to V. U to V. What direction is your thumb pointing? Toward the, into the board or out of the board? Into the board, right? So U to V is going into the board. Okay? U to V is into the board. Now, while I write that down, you do the same thing with V to U. Okay, so then now, now it's V to U, so then you hold your hand, you hold your hand parallel to V and you turn your fingers toward U, toward U, and now hold your thumb out. So can you see that V cross U is coming out of the page? Okay, so then, the fact that this is right, the fact that uh, these rules are obeyed is called, uh, is why this is called right-handedness. Because if you were, uh, that should be out of page, thank you. <coughs> so then, you would get the exact opposite result if you used your left hand, right? So then, the the choice is the right-handed choice. And understand that it's arbitrary, okay, but this is the choice that everyone uses. So then, here we go. So any question about this? So then it it's, will be totally reasonable for me to ask you a question, right? I could say, here's two vectors. I want you to tell me in this particular cross product, I give you vectors like whatever, you know, A and B. Here's two vectors. I draw them. Is, is the cross product AB going into the page or out of the page? And then, don't look around because you're not allowed to look around, but you'll see a bunch of people going, doing this kind of stuff. Incidentally, you'll see that a lot if you take organic chemistry as well because you're going to have to be figuring that out about molecules as well. And you'll see people going, trying, trying to figure it out. It's really funny to watch. Okay, so any question about this? <coughs> okay, so then the cross product is right-handed. Another very important property of the cross product, so this is a continuation of the previous page, is this. So we've said, we've said the direction of the cross product, right? We said that the direction of the cross product is orthogonal to the direction of the two arguments, u and v. And then we said, furthermore, since there's two directions that are orthogonal, we told you how to choose the one that's orthogonal, right? It's the right-handed choice. Okay, now, now we're going to have the length. Okay, so then the length of the cross product is uv, the length of u, the length of v times. Now, if this was the scalar product, if this was the scalar product, then this would be the length of u, the length of v times what? Okay. Times the cosine of theta. But this is not the scalar product, this is the cross product. So what do you suppose it's going to be here? The sine of theta, wonderful, okay. So it will be the length of u multiplied by the length of v multiplied by the sine of theta. All right, <coughs> so then let's try and understand why this is the case. Actually, I'm, I'm just going to say see the book because there's a boring argument to see, why this is, to see why this is true. See the book for a boring algebra. Okay, so <clears throat> any questions about that? So the length of the cross product is the length of u times the length of v times the sine of the angle between them. And that should be to you an echo, an echo uh, about <coughs> from the scalar product. And it should remind you of the scalar product. Okay, now four. This should be another echo of the scalar product. So then now, the scalar product 
If I give you two vectors, u and v, and I compute their scalar product, and, and u and v are orthogonal, then what is their scalar product? Zero, right? The scalar product of orthogonal vectors is zero. Right? That's one of the fundamental things I wanted you to see from last time. So then now, what if, what if I give you two vectors, u and v, and we compute their cross product, and we determine that it is the zero, not this, right? This would be incorrect. What's wrong with this statement? Right, zero is a scalar. So I can't say you, <laughs> there's a lot of things. <laughs> there's a lot of things wrong here, right? That shouldn't be there either. Okay, so then now, now the only thing wrong with this statement is that zero is a scalar, right? So then, what if u cross v is the zero vector? So you already know one case where this is true. I already wrote it down. What is one case where this is true? When u and v are the same, right? When u and v are the same vector, it, you get the zero vector. You know another case. You cross, there is something that you cross it with anything else whatsoever, you get the zero vector. The zero vector. So now you know two cases. But now this is the general case. U cross v is the zero vector exactly when u is a scalar multiple of v. Now, that is an algebraic quantifier, right? Exactly when u is a scalar multiple of v. So generally speaking, what this means is that this implies that IE uh, u is parallel to v or one of them is zero, since the book doesn't consider the zero vector to be parallel to anything. <coughs> I take, I sort of take exception to that. I don't think so. I think the zero vector is actually parallel to everything. Okay, but that's sort of a philosophical statement. Okay, so then what is this saying? Now this should be a strong echo, a strong echo of the scalar product. If I give you two vectors and the scalar product is zero, what is true about those vectors? Those vectors are orthogonal. Okay, now, linguistic antonym. What is the antonym of orthogonal? Parallel, right? So then, if I give you two vectors, u and v, and you compute their cross product, and the cross product is zero, then those vectors are parallel. Ah, okay, so then, do you see the strong connection by, I guess, opposites uh, to the scalar product and the cross product. Okay, good. <coughs> now the last one I'm going to state is this one. Uh, no, five comes after four. Okay, the last one is there is a very specific geometric interpretation of the length of the scalar product and it is the, of the cross product, I mean to say. The magnitude of the scalar product is the area of the parallelogram parallelogram gram with incident edges u and v that is to say if i was to draw this parallelogram Okay, I'm not an artist. I make no claims. <laughs> Just use your imagination. Okay, <coughs> then you can see that this is a parallelogram. And it has some area associated with it. Right? You can see that this is a parallelogram, or use your imagination to find a parallelogram that's approximately looking like that. It has an area. Okay, now, these vectors could be pointing anywhere in space, right, because these are three-dimensional vectors. Okay, so then you take those vectors and you rotate them until they're on, a, on the page, and then you can draw this parallelogram. The area of the parallelogram is the magnitude of u cross v. <coughs> okay? 
so that now this one is actually pretty easy to see so I'll go ahead and and do it <coughs> so if I now use my straight ruler to draw a better parallelogram okay so then this will be V and this other one U <coughs> then look good about like that yep good enough for me and then this one okay so then now I can measure this angle right here theta and now the question is is if I know if I knew this vertical distance H then what is the area of this parallelogram? So who remembers the formula for the area of a parallelogram? Right, it would be H, right, the height times the base, right, just like a rectangle. Okay, because what I could do is I could take this little piece of triangle, cut it, transplant it over here, and then it would be exactly a, a rectangle. Okay, so then the area should be, should be V multiplied by H, Right, so that's the area. Now, do you have some formula for H? Maybe in terms of U? Right, so you could say that, well, the length of this hypotenuse of that right triangle is, is magnitude of U. Okay, so then this should be equal to the length of V multiplied by the length of U multiplied by what trigonometric function? The sine of theta. And do you know something that is the length of V times the length of U times the sine of the angle between them? The magnitude of the cross product. Okay, good. Okay, so any question about this? The last thing I want to make, last comment I want to make about this mm, area thing, because the fact that this, that the cross product is related to an area is probably one of the most important things about the cross product is this is if I take if I take this thing <coughs> okay and then I modify it slightly right the difference between u and v if I compute the difference between u and v where does it go so the sum of u and v goes where this this diagonal right here. Okay, where does the difference go? The other diagonal. Okay, now I'd like to ask you, I have split this, I have split this uh, parallelogram into two what? Triangles. And so then, what would you say about the areas of those triangles? They should be equal, right? Those are two, those are two, uh, what? Congruent, is that the word? Yeah, congruent triangles. So then, they must have the same area. So what do you suppose the area is for one of those triangles? Half of the area of all of the parallelogram? Okay, so I will say no more about this matter. <coughs> so any question about this? Okay, good. So then the last uh, mention I want to make... The last mention I want to make about the cross product before we move on to more general concerns. Is that there is something called the scalar triple triple product. Okay, so the given three vectors, given U V W. <coughs> the scalar triple product, and I'll just write STP for that, is U dot V cross W. Okay, now, if you were to actually compute this, you would first compute a cross product. 
right? Which cross, uh, you would have to compute the <laughs> V cross product, V cross W. And then you would collect like terms and blah, 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 and then compute a scalar product, right? Is everybody with me? So then if you do this very carefully, if you do this very carefully, you will obtain the following formula, which I'm just going to write down. And I, maybe I'll have you prove it in the take-home quiz. So U1, U2, U3, okay, V1, V2, V3, and then W1, W2, W3. So then now, what is the meaning of this notation here? So yeah, what is this what is this array of nine numbers here called? This is called a a matrix, a matrix, and then these vertical bars are indicating that you're doing what with this matrix? A determinant. Okay, so then this is where it is understood that u as a vector has coordinates u1, u2, u3, v has coordinates v1, v2, v3, and w has coordinates, let's use our imagination, how about w1, w2, w3? Okay, so then now, the purpose of this formula, there's two reasons. Okay, there's two reasons for me to indicate this formula. One is it is significantly more rapid to use this determinant formula to compute the scalar triple product than it is to first compute a cross product and then compute a scalar product. It, this, it is significantly more rapid to carry this out. Okay, the second reason that I'm bringing this up is because it is related to something that I'm about to say, but I'm not going to say it yet. Now, these vertical bars, they represent determinant. That is what they represent. Now, tell me about the SIGNs of determinants. Okay, no, 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 not, not when you're doing expansion by coefficients, but, ge but generally speaking. Can you have a determinant which is zero? Yes, you can have a determinant which is zero. Can you have a determinant which is positive? Yes. Yes, you can. Can you have a determinant which is negative? Yes. Yes, yes you can. Okay. It doesn't matter that these look like, that looks like absolute value. Okay. It simply doesn't matter. You can have a negative determinant. Okay. The geometric meaning of that, maybe you'll find out in a later math class. But the reason why I'm saying this is because every semester, every semester, I get complaints from students saying that I computed the scalar triple product on WebAssign, and I got a negative answer, and WebAssign is wrong. No, it's not. No, it's not. Okay, the scalar triple product can be negative. There's no problem with that. Okay, so then let's do an example. <coughs> okay, so an example would be, mm, if I was to give you u is equal to uh, 2j minus 2k v is equal to 3i minus 5j minus 5j and then plus k and w w is equal to 3i plus j plus k. Okay, so I have three vectors. I want you to compute u scalar product v cross w. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is very carefully write down the determinant. <coughs> so what goes in the first row? Yes, zero. Why, where did that zero come from? There's no i, right? Zero, two, negative two, and then three, negative five, one, and then three, one, one. Okay, so does everybody agree that I've correctly read off the coefficients? <coughs> okay, so then this, this will be zero multiplied by it doesn't matter. And then what? Plus? 
minus, right? Minus 2, so now I'm in the second, the second position there, multiplied by the determinant of 3, 1, 3, 1. And then plus negative 2, multiplied by the determinant of what? 3, negative 5, 3, 1. Okay, so then that will be, the first term is 0, what's the second term? Also 0, so minus 0, and then minus 2 times, and what is the, this determinant? Which, which is it? 18 times 18, so altogether this is equal to what? Negative 36, and that is correct. It is negative 36. It doesn't matter if you think that the determinant si symbol looks like the absolute value symbol. <coughs> so any question about this example? Okay. Now, <coughs> here is the, re the reason for the complication, part of the uh, complicating matter, and it is this. There is a geometry, geom geometry of the scalar triple product. Okay, <coughs> now... If you were to take three vectors, okay, three vectors, and none of them are parallel to each other, right? None of them are parallel to each other, and they don't all exist in the same plane, then you could uh, have a drawing that looks something like this. Okay, so now this is really a test. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to attempt to do it. Mm, ruler, black, okay. So here's an axis. So this is a perspective view of the axis. Okay, so then now I'm going to attempt to indicate what I mean. This will mean that this is the z-axis. Right, so then now which one of these should be x and which one of them should be y? The hor the, well, I guess I suppose you mean this one. Okay, so then now wh why well, why is that the case? Let's write it in the wrong order, and someone tell me why this is the wrong order. Y, X. This is wrong. Okay. So then now, right, which one is... How about this? I can ask this. Which is the first axis? Which is the first coordinate? X, Y, or Z? X. Which is the second? Y. Which is the third? Z. So you should be able to take the first and second coordinate axes, cross them, and find the third. So then now, with your hands and do the little thingy, cross X and Y. Like this. So which direction is my thumb pointing? Down. So could that be, that, could that be correct? No, 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 no. It needs to point up. It needs to be parallel with the Z axis. So those are in the wrong position. All right, so now let's erase these. And redo it like so. Now, does that look right? Now cross X and Y. Like so. You can see that F X crossing Y is parallel to the Z axis, so it's going upward. Okay, so then that is the reason why, why these are <coughs> arranged like so. Okay, now, if I was to draw uh, some vectors here. Now, this is where things get beautiful. Okay. So there's some vector, here's some other vector, and here's some other vector. Okay, now, this, <coughs> I'm going to try and indicate, forms a geometric shape. Okay, and it, it, has, a, it has a nice and funny name. <coughs> I hope you can see what I'm trying to draw here. It's like a box, but I tilted it over. Okay, so does everybody see this shape? Now, such a shape, if, if all of those vectors met at a right angle, at, right, at orthogonal, uh, then 
such a shape would just be a box, right? Specifically, it would be a right rectangular prism. So think of if you've ever, you know, gotten a refrigerator box or just some big box, right? I put my finger on the corner of it and then make it lean over a little bit, right? So can everybody see the picture I'm trying to draw? So such a shape is called a parallelopiped. <laughs> yeah, isn't that lovely? That's a wonderful word. Parallela. Piped. Parallelopiped. Okay, now the significance I'm trying to get to is that the volume, right, you can see that this is a box, okay, or a box shape, a parallelopiped shape. So it has a volume associated to it. Its volume is <coughs> the absolute value of the scalar triple product. The absolute value. Okay, now this, you know, I can, you know, sort of, at least a little bit, forgive a little bit of the confusion, but not really. So then now, what if, what if I was to take the previous example and say that I have some box, I have some three vectors, they form the incident edges of, the, of one corner of a parallelopiped, okay, and I want you to find the volume of this thing. Right, so then we previously computed that the scalar triple product of, of U, V, and W is negative 36. So what is the volume of the corresponding parallelopiped? 36. Okay, and that's the other thing that I always get comments about is someone says, WebAssign is wrong. The volume of that thing is negative 36. No. Okay, volumes are positive. Okay, volumes are positive things. Okay, so any question about this uh, comment? The volume of a parallelopiped. Okay, so then now, these are, these are mostly, I would say, the important things about the cross product. Okay, so geometrically, the cross product <coughs> of two vectors, the magnitude of it represents the area of the parallelogram corresponding to them. Okay, so you can find the area of half of the parallelogram by dividing by two. Uh, if I take two vectors and cross them, then the result is orthogonal to both of those to both of those vectors. So a typical question I could say is, here's, here's two vectors, u and v. I want you to find a vector that is orthogonal to both of them. What would you do? What would you do? Cross product. Cross product. Okay, you compute the cross product. What if I said, here's two vectors, I want you to find a unit vector which is orthogonal to both of them. Right, you, you compute the cross product to find a vector which is orthogonal. And then you divide by the length of it to find a unit vector. Okay. So any questions about those kinds of things? The cross product, yay. Okay, so now we move on to section 11.5. Okay. <coughs> Which is called lines and planes. And then they try and make it real exciting, and they say, in space. <laughs> right? Everything is cooler sounding if you say in space. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean outer space. Unfortunately, this just means three dimensions, <laughs> okay? as opposed to some other dimension. So sorry if I got you overexcited there. <clears throat> okay, so then, now the first thing, the first thing, is I would like to remind you from Calculus 1, Calculus 1, a line can be written in this way. Y is blah, blah, plus blah, is what? MX plus B, right? That's the, that's the way it's typically written down. Okay, now, the reason why I'm writing this down is because I want to make some analogies. Now, this thing right here is called the what of the line? the slope of the line. Okay, and this other thing is called the what of the line? The intercept. In particular, in this form, it's called the y-intercept. Because, and the thing that I'm going to make analogy to is that here, what this is telling you is the point 0B is on the line. Because if you were to take that equation, y is mx plus b, and plug in 
x is equal to 0, then you ob obtain y is equal to b. So 0, b is on the line. So then what, what this is telling you what this is telling you is that you have a line is sort of in calculus one defined by two things the slope which is sort of telling you the direction the general direction in which the line is going and a single point that is on the line right zero b so it tells you these two things now in, in here in this in this case is exactly the same it's exactly the same so then now This is calculus two. Okay. And now a line looks like this. R of T is M T plus B. <coughs> okay, now the reason for the names of my choices is because I want to emphasize to you the analogy between these two. So then now, if you plug in any value whatsoever into this function r of t, then that point is on the line. So for example, what's something really easy to plug in? Okay, what's something even easier than that? Zero. zero. Okay, so if you plug in zero, what do you get? B. Right, you get B. This is on the line. Okay, now another thing is we have this other piece right here. This is not, if you were, when we were talking about the 2417 context, we called that the slope. The calculus one context, we called that the slope. But it doesn't really make sense to say slope now because we're not on a plane, we're actually in space. So this is just called the direction of the line. in the direction of a line. Okay, so let's make sure that we can all uh, understand these instructions. So as an example, <coughs> I could say, how about R of t is equal to 1, 2, negative 3 uh, t plus something else great like 0, 1 pi Okay, so then the first question, question number one, I want you to tell me the direction of the line. So it's, this is not a trick question at all. One, two, negative three, right? Okay, now, now, I want you to tell me three points which are on the line. Okay, so I'm going to take the easy one. Okay, so here's one. I take zero, one pi. You have to find two others. So what are two other points that are on the line? Okay, so what do you think? Be <coughs> uh, should these be parentheses? That is back to the hammer comment that I made previously. I made the hammer comment, right? Mm -hmm. About the use of a vector and points and things like this. The difference between a vector and a point is a, is a historical anomaly. And in a few decades, hopefully, I hope we won't say any difference between them. So the answer is is that I didn't really define what the sum of a vector and a point is, even though it's exactly what you think, so I'm writing vector here. <laughs> okay, so what is another point which is on the line? Okay, so if you plug in 1, for example, right, so then if you do that, what do you get? 1, 3, and then pi minus 3. Okay, great, so then now the secret is out. Right, so then what's some other point that's on the line? How about I plug in 10? Since probably nobody did that. So then this will be what, if I can do it, 10 plus 
20, uh, 10 and then 21 and then pi minus 30. Great. Okay, so there's three different points on the line. So any question about this? Any question about this? <coughs> okay, so then now let's do something that's really complicated, but not really. So for example, now if I am in if I am in space, right? That is to say, three dimensions. Then I can single out any two different points in space. And I can single them out, and I can say to you now, find the equation of a line which passes through these two points. Because there is a line that passes through, th through those points. Right? So then, I've just told you every line can be written as R of t is mt plus b for some m and some b. So you should be able to tell me, if I give you two points, the equation of a line between them. So give find the line which contains A is 1, 2, 3, and B is something else great, like, uh, I don't know, 1, 4, 7. Okay, so while you're, while you're doing that, I'm just going to make a couple comments. So, whatever the case is, right, no matter how I situated the points A and B in space, I can always change the coordinate system so I can grab these two points and rotate them until I put them on the paper. Right? I can always fit the piece of paper so that the two points are on the piece of paper. So, I can draw them on the page, like so. I could say that, well, here's A and here's B. Right, I can always do that. Okay, now how many, thi oh, how many things do I need to define the line? I need two things. I had a point which is on the line and the direction of the line. So then finding a point which is on the line is pretty straightforward. <laughs> which point, what is a point that is on the line? One, two, three. How did you figure that out? <laughs> because I, I said it's on there. Okay. So why did you choose A? Could you have chosen B? Yes, you could have chosen B. It doesn't matter. Okay. So then what I really need is I need the direction the line is traveling. So how do I find the direction the line is traveling? Right. I can compute the coordinates of the directed line segment from A to B. That is to say, I could choose some other nice color here like that one and do this. Right, this, this I'll say is M is equal to AB, like so. Incidentally, I wrote AB. Now, that means I made a choice. Inci the formula for AB is what? B minus A. Could I have just as well said M is B, uh, BA? Yes. Yes, I could have just as well said that. So then M is AB, so then that's B minus A. So on this particular question, that will be what? So 0, and then 2, and then 4, like that. Not so great at arithmetic. So then R of T, R of T can be 0, 2, 2, 4, T, plus, uh, what did, which one did we say we liked? 1, 2, 3? There we are. So there's the equation. There is one of the equations of the line. So then, why do I say one of the equations? Because there's infinitely many different ones, right? So I could have just as well used this one. I could have said, well, Q of t is how about zero two four, and then t, and then plus the other point one four seven. Right here's two different things. <coughs> Okay, they both are equations of the line. So any question about this one? Okay, now I need to make a remark. Now, this, form, this format for the line that I've given you is computationally the most useful format. However, there are two other formats that are frequently given, and so I need to write them down for you so that you can see what they are.
Okay, so then if we have this general form of a line, R of T is ABC T plus, uh, I guess I'll say it like this, X1, Y1, Z1. So this is the general form of a line in space for some point x1, y1, z1, for some direction a, b, c. Then it is typical, it is typical to write this, th the line in this way. x is equal to a, t plus x1. y is equal to, now use your imagination, what do you suppose it's supposed to be? Right, b, t plus y1. And then now z is c, t plus z1. So very frequently, lines are given in this way, especially in this book. Okay, so I could give you a line, I could give you a line like this. This is the way I'll always give you lines, almost all the time. The book will frequently say them like this. Okay, now one last thing I want to point out is that <coughs> 2, if a is not 0, a could be 0. But if it's not 0, then notice, I could take this equation, x is a t plus x1, plus x1, and I could solve for t. Right? I could say that this is the same thing as x minus x1 is equal to a t, and this is the same thing as saying that what? x minus x1 over a is t. Okay, and I can, the reason, why do I need A not to be zero? So I can perform that division at last. Okay, so then now, there was nothing special about X, the symbol X. So then what if A, B, and C are all non-zero? Then I can solve for T in each one of them. If A, B, C all non-zero, then... <coughs> you can solve that t is equal to x minus x1 over a. That's what we just said. But you can also determine that it is equal to y minus y1 over b. And you can also determine that it is z minus z1 over c. Okay, and this form that I'm boxing here, this is the last form of the line that I'm going to talk about. So this form, the book frequently calls it the symmetric form. It is actually, in my opinion, quite useless because you can't even write it that way if A, B, or C is zero. And that's, it's totally legitimate to have A or B or C zero. Okay, so any question about these things? So basically what it comes down to is you're going to have to be able to convert in between these lines. My recommendation to you is no matter what form is given to you, the first step in your problem should be to write it like this, <laughs> the way that I gave you in the first place. Okay, so any question concerning this? Okay, so let's continue. <coughs> okay, now, uh, let's try a problem. Find the line through the point, how about one, two, three, which is orthogonal to u is zero, one, two, and also v is, uh, how about one, uh, five, negative two. Find the line through 1, 2, 3, which is orthogonal to both of these. Okay, so generally speaking, the equation of a line is this. R of t is mt plus b. Right, so what things do you need to finish the problem? What letters? You need m and b. Right, so one of them, according in the way the question is stated, is given to you for free. What is, what is the one that is given for free? It's B, right? You immediately know that B is what? 1, 2, 3. Okay, now M is just 
almost given to you, right? M is the direction of the line, and I've told you that the line is orthogonal to these two other vectors that I've given you for some reason. So now, if only you had some way, given two vectors, to find a third vector which is orthogonal to the two I gave you. Ah, the cross product, right? So I'm not even going to go any further on this problem because I can assume you can carry out the arithmetic from here. Okay, so then B I gave to you for free. Okay, B I gave to you for free. M, the direction you can compute by computing the cross product of those vectors. And then you just write down the answer. Okay, so any question about this example? Any question about this example? Okay, now before we can get any further, before we can get any further, we also need to talk about this other thing in space. So then what was the title of this thing, of this section? Lines and planes in space, right? So then, planes in space. Okay, so now, given any line, right, given any two points, you can find a line that goes in between them, right, give a line that goes in between them. And conceptually speaking, a line is always represented by a point which is on the line and the direction the line is going. Right, it's always those two things, a point which is on the line and the direction the line is going. Okay, now a plane in 3D uh, has a very interesting duality to the line because now, one thing you can say is that given any three points, given any three points, right, what can be fit through those three points? A plane, right, you can always put a plane through those three points. Okay, but it, it doesn't take three things to define a plane. It only takes two things to define a plane. Okay, so then now imagine the plane of the floor. You can see me standing on the plane of the floor. So I'm going to describe the plane of the floor as follows. It is, it contains the point I'm standing on. Right, it contains the point I'm standing on. And you choose any other point on the plane. And you measure its angle to me. And it's orthogonal to me. Right? So then in a sense, I'm describing the plane like this. It's the duality, it's the dual of the line. So a line is represented by a point on the line and the direction the line is going. A plane is represented by a point on the plane and the direction the plane is not going. Right? The, the plane is not going in my direction. It's only going in those directions. Okay, so there are two things required for a plane. Okay, so then <coughs> given a plane... So, a plane is given by two things. One, a point which I'll call B, I guess. B is equal to X1, Y1, Z1, which is on the plane. And two, a normal N, which I'll write as ABC, which is orthogonal to the plane. Okay, so then if you have these things, X1, Y1, Z1, and ABC, the equation of the plane is A multiplied by X minus X1 plus B multiplied by Y minus Y1 plus C multiplied by Z minus Z1 is equal to zero. So that is the equation of a plane. Okay, so then now, let's make sure we can read back these instructions. So, for example, <coughs> for example, I could give you this equation. 3x plus 4y minus z plus 10 is equal to 0. Okay, so this is the equation of a plane. 
Okay, it's the equation of the plane. Something is really easy to read off of it. Here's this first thing, the normal. You should be able to read it off immediately without even thought. So what is the normal to the plane? 3, positive 4, negative 1. Right, so 3, 4, negative 1. Okay, 3, 4, negative 1. <coughs> Okay, now, slightly more complicated, how do you find a point on the plane? And it's not so easy to read off according to the previous equation. So then, what you should do is you should start sort of ho <laughs> doing things that would be nice. Wouldn't it be nice if x was 0? That would be great. So if x was 0, then you wouldn't have to worry about any of the x's. It would also be really nice if y was 0 then you wouldn't have to worry about any of the y's. Now, you can't take this too far, right? If you say z is 0, then you would have the equation negative 10 is equal to 0, and that can no longer be, a, be, the, be true. Okay, so if you take these two to be true, then you have the equation negative z plus 10 <coughs> is equal to 0. So then what, it, what must z be equal to? To 10. So then you could say that there is a point which is on the plane 0, 0, 10. That's on the plane. Is that the only point on the plane? No, right? Planes have lots of points, generally speaking. So then you could just choose some other value for x. Like you could plug in, for example, you could plug in x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1, and then in that case, z would be equal to seventeen. Right, that would have also been acceptable. Okay, so then any question about this? So how do I know, someone explain to me why I know the point zero, zero, zero is not on the plane, not on this plane. How do you know, how do you know that the point zero, zero, zero is not on the plane? Because if you plug it into the equation, you get the statement negative 10 is equal to 0. Is that a true statement? No. So 0, 0, 0 is not on the plane. So how about 1, 2, 3? Is 1, 2, 3 on the plane? i got to think about it for a second. So is it? No. 1, 2, 3 is not on the plane because if you were to plug in 1, 2, 3, you would get 3 plus 8 is 11 minus that is 8. You would get 8 plus 10 is 0. Is that true? No. So 1, 2, 3 is not on the plane. However, if you plug in 0, 0, 10, what do you get? You get 0 is equal to 0. Is that a true statement? Yes. So 0, 0, 10 is on the plane. Okay. Good. Example. So how about I give you three points? A is 1, 2, 3. B is, uh, I don't know, negative 1, 4, 7. And C is equal to... 3, 0, 1. So these three points, they're somehow situated in space. I just more or less just randomly just selected them, just their coordinates. Okay, now, through any three points, I can fit a plane. So my question is, is find the plane which contains ABC. Okay, so then now, these three po points are arrayed somehow through space. Now I'm going to go through the following logical operation. I'm going to put, put the plane which does go through them. I'm going to rotate this plane so that it fits on the page, so I can draw all of ABC on the page if, as long as I rotate the coordinate system enough. So then I can say that, well, here lies A, here lies B, and here lies C. after a sufficient rotation. Okay, so then now, how many things do you need to define a plane? Two things, right? A point which is on the plane and a normal to the plane. One of those things was given to you for free. Which one? A point on the plane. What point is on the plane? A or B or C. It doesn't matter which one you choose. Any one of them is on the plane. Now what I need is I need something that is orthogonal to the plane. 
Uh, you, so you're saying, what if I chose A and compute B cross C? It's a good idea, but it's not quite right. Yes? Ah, there we go. Here we go. So I'm going to do them uh, like this. So then I could say, well, there is a vector, or if you like, um, what was it? Directed line segment. There is a directed line segment pointing from A to B, and there is another directed line segment pointing from A to C, like so. Right. So then if I call, if I call this U, and I call this one V, then now, ah, now I'm starting to see. I have two vectors, and I, I want to find something that is orthogonal to both of them. How do I find a vector orthogonal to both U and V? The cross product, right? So then the last, I'm not actually going to compute the cross product because I'll let you do that in your own time. U, right, is B minus A. V is what? According to the way I've drawn it. C minus A. And the normal to the plane will be U cross V. Okay, so then how many things did we need to define a plane? Two, right? A point and a normal? A point and a normal? So then we've found them, right? Any one of those points is on the plane, and this is how you compute the normal of that plane. Okay, so any question about this one? <coughs> any question about this one? <coughs> okay, so we continue, because these examples are so enjoyable. Okay. So, let's try and think of some fantastic way to come up with a, to come up with a, a line or a plane or something. <coughs> okay, so then how about, hmm, I don't like any of these. So, how about I give you a line. R of t is 1, 2, 3, t plus 5, 6, 7. And I give you another point. B is equal to something great like 10, 9, 8. I want you to find a plane. Through B, which is orthogonal. To R. Okay, so one of these points, one of these things was given to you for free. So what what is on the plane? B is ten nine eight. What is the normal to the plane? Okay, so then let's try and think about what, th what this is saying. So then now, I'm on the plane, say, I, there was a plane. There's a plane somehow that I'm trying to describe. Okay, and it exists and I've rotated it onto the floor so that I'm standing on it. Now, I'm the line R of T, and I'm standing orthogonal to the plane. So then, what is, what is normal to the plane? I am, right? R of T is. So then what, what is the, what is a normal to the plane? 1, 2, 3 is. Alright, 1, 2, 3 is normal. Okay, so then just to make sure that we write this down at least once, right, you could say that the equation of the plane is 1 multiplied by x minus 10 plus 2 multiplied by what do you think? y minus 9 plus 3 m multiplied by z minus 8 is equal to what? 0, right? So then at various situations I'll say, and I want you to multiply this out and collect like terms or something, something, something. Okay, so then you'll just need to do that according to whatever instruction I give. <coughs> okay. So there are lots of examples in the book and I don't have enough time to sit here and go through every single possible iteration but let's sort of hand wave our way through some of them so what if I have two planes All right, so for example the plane of the floor and the plane of the wall 
Okay, now the plane, the, these two planes of the floor and the wall, they're not parallel. Right? Those two planes are not parallel. Okay, so then they intersect somewhere. What is the intersection of two planes? A line. Right? So then can you see that I could say, here's one plane and here's another plane. I want you to find the, the equation of the line of their intersection. Okay, so then how many things do you need to define the line? Two things, right? A point which is on the line and the direction of the line. So how do you find a point which is on two different planes? It's on both planes. Right, you have to perform, you have to do an algeb algebraic computation to find a, solu a point which is a solution to the first plane and is also a solution to the second plane. Right? There's an example of doing that algebraic computation in the book. Now the thing that's more interesting is what if you have a plane and you want to find the direction of the uh, two planes and you want to find the direction of their intersection? How do you do that? So then look at the plane of the floor and look at the plane of the wall. What direction is the intersection going? Right, that way. Right, you can see that little seam right there is the intersection. So then now, I'm standing normal to the floor. And I'm holding my arm normal to the board. And now I'm holding my other arm normal to my body and my other arm. So you can find this one. Right? This is the normal to the first plane. You can find this one. This is the normal to the second plane. How do you find something that is pointing in the direction of their intersection? The cross product, right? The cross product of normals. So if I give you two planes and you need to find the direction of their intersection, the way to find the direction of the line of intersection is the cross product of their normals. Okay, so then th these questions all go like this. It's going to be, for some reason, I want you to find a line or a plane. It's always two things. You need to find which is a, po a point which is on the object, a point on the line or a point on the plane. And then you need to find a direction, right? either the direction of the line or the normal to the plane. And then you just write down whatever the answer is. See you. <coughs>